And this is where the intro music goes. People are listening to the intro music now. Right, my podcast. What is up, everybody? Welcome to the 2 a.m. Burrito Show with Big Chief Burrito. And today, my partner in crime, Kenny. <clears throat> What's up? What's going on? How you doing today? Doing all right. Doing all right. Long day of, or long evening into morning of recording videos and stuff. But um, I did want to bring you on for, you know, your views on a couple of things and somebody to shoot my ideas off of for the podcast. And even though you don't acquire status of having a GH5 pointed at you, we did get a little GoPro up here so that people can see you. And this is the man that's behind the scenes. Indeed. <laughs> and it's those contributions just like that, that that's, that's why you're here for the deep philosophical contributions to the cause. All right. So we're going to start off and obviously Kenny just jump in whenever you want. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, what's been going on with everybody? We started the new podcast. Episode one went up there, and it's going to be a mix of things that interest me about the week. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of movie talk because obviously I'm a filmmaker. Um, so that's going to be my week in media in a second. But what's uh, what's been happening this week? The big story is obviously Memorial Day is coming up, and it's actually today as we're recording this. Um, and you know, the thing that strikes me about Memorial Day, obviously, is the mattress sales, you know, and how they associate mattress sales with dead soldiers for some reason, um, or getting a new car. But as we all know, or should know, Memorial Day is not about the veterans. It's not about, you know, uh, like the 4th of July about pride in your nation. It's you know, interesting choice of words. Um, but it is about those who served and were lost. And obviously uh, we don't diminish what their loss signifies to any country. Um, obviously the one that we're living in as we you know, celebrate it this weekend or at least uh, commemorate people that were lost. So if you have family members um, who have served and were lost then obviously our thoughts are with you during this Memorial Day. But in podcast fashion, go ahead, Kenny. My dad was in the Navy. Yeah? Yeah, so he's a vet. He's a vet? Yep. So, but he, I mean, even he would be like, well, Veterans Day is for me, but Memorial Days are like for his homies or whatever that were like, you know, that didn't make it back home, et cetera. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 you know, we might, you know, plus, you know, plus, you know, uh, U.S. is getting almost to 100,000 deaths uh, due to COVID or... And even like if you like, oh, you know, they're inflating the numbers, but let's say they're lying and half of them are made up numbers. That's still 50,000 Americans. So on this Memorial Day, you know, we're reaching like a very ugly um, benchmark for stuff like that. And people are pretty much OK, either in two camps. You know, it hasn't changed so much in the week. It's either you're cautious and you're like, well, I kind of want to see how this goes or you just do not give a fuck and you're just ready to go out there and you're just like, I don't want to wear a mask. I just want to get everybody back to normal. I just want to just go out there and do my thing. I've seen pictures of and video of bars packed, pool parties going, um, beaches, uh, the Ozarks, I guess, were going crazy, like everywhere. Just people are just ready to go. And then I think I'm sort of in between as in, you know, I got a very exciting text a few days ago because I was about to cut, give myself my second Corona cut and my barber, uh, shout out Crispy Cuts, um, sent me a text that he was going to open this week by appointment only. There's a whole bunch of shit, you know, they're taking appointments, cleaning in between, stuff like that. And I had to make that decision. I was like, okay. Am I going to give myself a Corona cut or am I going to venture out into the world and get a haircut some point this week? Because there's few things in life, you know, uh, a good dump, taking a good dump, you know, uh, the other thing, obviously. And then uh, getting out of the chair after getting a fresh cut, that's a good feeling, right, Kenny? Yeah, it is. Especially when you roll down the window and the air hits you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. You put your 
hand behind your ear. You got those little stragglers back there. That dude. fresh, fresh cut. Yeah, fresh right there. Your girl, your girl puts your hair, hand on the back of your head, feels it all. Like, oh, yeah. Like that, you know? Big confidence boost. Yeah, yeah, it's always. And um, so, yeah, so that, that's, that's the dilemma right now because I think I want to start going out more because I think, you know, even though I work from home, I do most shit from home, I record this podcast and videos from home. I still think at some point, you know, like uh, Dr. Fauci said, you know, staying at home forever is not good because you need to get out there and you need to get some of these lower lying diseases and, you know, viruses that won't really do shit to you but help you build uh, immunities to it. Um, so at some point, are you in the let's just be super safe about it and just shut everything down for like longer than we need to just so that we're sure that we can control it? Or are you in the, well, I think no matter how much you fight it, there's still it's still going to spread. So we might as well start kind of opening shit back up. Which which side of the street do you walk on, Kenny, mostly? Um, For me, it really depends on where the country is at, really, where the world is at. Um, I kind of base, base that answer off of what I see happening around the world and so far I just don't f- at, still at this point don't with the numbers as high as they are I just don't see a reason why we should be you know going back out so fast I think um, with the handling that we had without getting too political um the pressure and the push to tell people to do the right thing and to stay indoors for a good amount of time so we can really curve the numbers really didn't happen. So, and it really still hasn't happened. So, you know, I say stay indoors for a little bit longer. Let's, let's curve. I want a haircut. Fuck that. <laughs> Fuck that. Grow it out. Let's get natural. Because <laughs> well, yeah, when you grow your shit out, it's a fucking nice, even fucking fro. When I grow mine out, I look like I'm fucking my age, and I don't like that. I need to keep the fucking fresh fade to keep the youthful, exuberant appearance. That's why we grow. We adapt. To which my fans are accustomed. I'm about, I'll, I'll, I'm about to line you up with my new clippers that are on the way in the mail. Sold. Sold. All right. So I was thinking what the best movie to watch on Memorial Day that encompassed uh, sort of the, the feeling. Because, you know, it's like you don't want to go watch like Independence Day because that's a Fourth of July movie. And you don't necessarily maybe want to watch something like Saving Private Ryan because that's got a lot of, you know, violence and shit like that. So in between. So in my scientific approach, I believe that the best movie to watch during Memorial Day is not a movie at all, but... Hey, you got family around. You're like, hey, what's up? Why don't we pop in uh, or go on H? I think it's on HBO. And why don't we watch Band of Brothers? Right? Cool. HBO show, high production value. It's about World War II. It's about a band of brothers and the brotherhood of war. And then there's characters that make it and don't make it. And, you know, since we're memorializing the people that didn't make it through a lot of these conflicts, then I think that is the perfect movie to watch on Memorial Day. But Lou, what is the worst possible movie to watch on Memorial Day? And that is another movie about the same war, but that is a billion times more horrible, and that is Pearl Harbor, which is one of the worst movies of all time, no matter which way you slice it. What kind of, uh, what do you think the, a, good, uh, a good Memorial Day movie would be, Kenny? I have no idea. I mean, you didn't have a chance like me to make notes and prepare for the podcast. Definitely not. I mean, you could always go for the feel of a movie, like kind of a feel, like you know, it's because usually what people do, they're they're barbecuing, they're partying, they're with friends or family. So, Kenny, don't try to outsmooth me on the voice. I mean, you're trying to be too smooth right there. I feel like you're delivering. Get out of here! Get out of here! Get out of here! Don't try to outsmooth me. But anyways, back to what I was saying before I lose my track of thought. I am smoking over here, Chief. But, um, yeah, the theme, like, uh, the feel, I would say. It doesn't really have to be, you know... It doesn't have to be a war movie. War movie. Okay. It, it can be, like, Independence Day, like, with Will Smith. Like, mm. you know, you and So your you would watch Independence Day on Memorial Day? 
Yeah, with the family or with friends or mm-hmm. having okay, okay. barbecue, uh, drinking, you know. We kill the typical game. money grabs. All right. Uh, also, as we segue from Memorial Day movies, um, there's a report in the news that rats are being more aggressive. And not just Takashi 6 9 but actual rats that are in the sewers, that are in the subways, that are all over New York and other places of the world that are used to having, and this is what's happening to a lot of the like um, animals that congregate against tourist areas. I'm assuming seagulls are like, where the fuck is everybody? I haven't been able to come down and snatch somebody's french fries in a minute. Um, but there, there is this sort of, you know, because we put the, the planet on pause, not on like a full pause, not like on a full stop, just kind of like a, a pause. Um, and, you know, life uh, finds a way, as they say. So animals have been moving back into kind of in- the encroachments that people had made on them. You know, kind of like Shy Girl takes over the couch in the bed. You done scratching over there? You know, beware of the rodents. You know, is this the year of the rat? Is 2020 a year of the rat? I have no idea what year it is. I knew, but I forgot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is it? That shit just happened. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, besides super aggressive rats, is um, the extended reaction to the Michael Jordan doc. Last week when I talked about it, it, was, it had just finished airing, um, and I recorded that same Sunday night when the episode 9 and 10 aired and I don't I think that it got a lot of like oh my god it's it's the best sports documentary of all time which I absolutely don't agree with number one because it wasn't coming from an objective place this is all footage that Jordan owned so they couldn't make the documentary without him agreeing to certain stuff and even though it went into some of the deeper darker areas of his past um, I think it still was specifically viewed through a Jordan tinted lens, if that makes sense. And Horace Grant, a couple of other players from the early 90s Knicks teams, Knicks teams, uh, Bulls teams, um, were basically saying that some, something similar, that they made Scotty look bad, they made other players look bad, and that, you know, but this is fucking Michael Jordan. This is a guy who brought literally the guy he was cut for on his high school, was it JV or varsity? I think it was JV. He got cut for a guy on one of his early basketball teams, and he brought this dude, probably all expenses paid, to his frigging Hall of Fame induction. So I don't put it past Michael Jordan to to, to do stuff like that. But this, the point is he, he made these, he made, he was in one of the early episodes where you're saying, oh, I walked in there. And they had coke and women and weed and stuff like that. And, you know, they're sort of accusing him of breaking the player's code in terms of what goes on in the locker room, what goes on in a hotel room does not get spoken about outside of the locker room. And, I mean, to a degree, I I mean, it happened, what, 40 years ago at this point? Well, the 80s are almost, the 80s were 40 years ago. 35 years ago, mid-80s. You know, I, 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 again, this documentary is from Michael's point of view. So he was going to throw whoever he wanted to under the bus. He was going to, he could choose to skew the conversation one way or another. The one thing that did sort of get reinforced in my mind was my dislike for Scottie Pippen. Because I feared, you feared, I feared and respected Jordan as an opponent from a fan's perspective, obviously. And it scared me to death to have to go up against him in a series or when my team was going up against him in a series more specifically. But I just hated, hated Scottie Pippen. Not only because he had that nasty-ass dunk over Ewing where he just dragged his nuts all over his chest and stood over him, and it was just like, Egh! and, But because I just don't think of him as a clutch player. He took himself out of that game when they were going to give the final shot to Kukoc. He put himself ahead of the team in terms of his contract negotiations. This is all stuff that they covered in the in the documentary. 
and I think that 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 this doc really did reinforce. But I don't think I needed a documentary about the, you know, six-time world champion Chicago Bulls to remind me that I hated Scottie Pippen. But do you think telling those stories in his own documentary makes Michael Jordan a snitch? Did he break the player's code? And because I always like to ask three-part questions, Kenny. Who was your least favorite basketball player growing up, the player that you hated the most? It probably was somebody on the Celtics since I'm a Laker fan. Um, KG? No. Paul Pierce? Probably Paul. Like Paul Pierce? Yeah. Yeah. Probably Paul. Or somebody on the Kings. I don't know why. I didn't. Some reason the Kings well, got under my skin sometime. Of, had a lot of those big battles, like when Mike Williams, uh, Chris Webber, when, when Tim Duncan and all. Tim Duncan, right? Yeah. No, Tim Duncan. It was Spurs. Late Spurs. That was Spurs. Yeah. Yeah, they fucked with the. They they they, they knocked the Lakers out a lot. Nah, I never was the Spurs. It was the Kings. But do you think that he broke the sort of player's code by kind of alluding to the fact that when he was a rookie, he would go to hotel rooms and, and see shit going on and stuff like that? Because you, you can do the math and kind of figure out what players he was talking about because he was basically saying the whole team was there. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I, 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 I wanted you to talk about last time was uh, about Jordan is um, how if you ever pissed him off, like he got you back tenfold. Like he he got under your skin. Like he talked trash. He was one of yeah, the best. Yeah, there was at least you know three or four instances that it was like part of, part of the game. You know, but he was he was just like master at it. Like there was the instance though that they cover in the documentary where there was a player and the player had like a really good game against him one day. And at the end of the game, he, like, said something that was, like, good game, Mike, like, in a sarcastic way. And then the next time they played, which was, like, on a back-to-back, so it was, like, the next night, Jordan went off for, like, 35 in the first half against him. Yeah. But then he goes on to say that that never happened. The guy never said nice game in that way. That was just – he just created that in his mind. So not only would he do that when you really said some shit for real, but if he needed something to motivate himself, he would make it up. And when that happened, the Knicks were up 2-0 on the Bulls conference. I think it was conference finals. And a story came out about him that he was going to uh, Atlantic City to gamble before the game. Something they, they Some story about him came out, like, after game two when the Knicks were up fucking 2-0. Best chance we ever had of beating the uh, Jordan's Bulls. And right after that story came out, it fucking hit him so hard that he just fucking destroyed us. And so, thanks, media. Um, but, yeah, he was, he was he's definitely, you know. So... The initial, I think, fawning over him over the documentary, it's like, oh, wow. And there's obviously a lot of people that didn't see him in his prime or they were too young to really recognize what they were seeing. So I think the documentary is good for, for those people so that it kind of solidifies him. But, the, you know, um, then, the, then the sort of narrative switch to because there's no sports, so they have to fucking come up with shit to talk about is Jordan versus Kobe, Jordan versus LeBron. You know, is LeBron the best of all time? Is Kobe the best of all time? Uh, LeBron, and I've always said that, and obviously a million people have said it, but I don't think LeBron can be a top five player of all time because he's not even a top five Laker. The fact that he switched around from Cleveland to Miami to L.A., um, I think takes him out of the top, top, out of the GOAT discussion, in my opinion. I think it's more Kobe versus MJ. And like I said before, I wish their careers have overlapped more so that they would have had some better battles against each other. But um, I still give it to MJ over Kobe in that in that perspective. Because um, I don't think they could have been a Kobe without MJ coming before him because Kobe mirrored his game against him. So, you know, that's where it's going to go down to, you know, talking heads have to talk about something. So then that's where that whole thing go. But the backlash to the um, – but the backlash that happened afterwards was more about – 
you know, how does Jordan come off? First, it was like everybody was fawning over him, and then people start trying to find shit to nitpick, obviously. Because, obviously, there is no sports. Right? Um, Mike Tyson might make a comeback. He dropped that video of him, like, fucking bobbing and weaving. Man. I mean, scary. He would scare the, I mean, He's in his 50s. He would scare the shit out of pretty much every heavyweight. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> it was like that old joke. It was like, would you get in the ring for Mike Tyson for a million dollars? It's like, yeah, but how would you count it afterwards? I know, right? Because your head would be gone. You'd be, only be able to count to 10 and shit. Uh, and uh, the Oscars are getting pushed back. Possibly. I mean, there's no Oscars, but I don't know if they if they don't do any Oscars in February. Um, I mean, we might have a, a, a calendar year because obviously production is going to be slowed. So I would suggest that they just the next there's there's definitely I don't think going to be a, a big award season in February because that's when the Oscars typically are. So I think that they're just going to have to roll it over until the next year and then just have these two years be as one in terms of the films that that qualify. And they're going to have to allow a lot of direct-to-video movies to be considered. But obviously, I think that's the right idea. Yeah, somebody was making a joke about um, Sonic the Hedgehog uh, winning all the awards. <laughs> I'm not running away with all the points. Because it was the only movie that got released this year. Yeah. And Cats. And Cats. <laughs> Which is not gonna <laughs> make it the best animated cat dick. I haven't even seen it, and I know it's not gonna make it from all the therapy people have to take after watching it. That's that's another bad, a good one. Uh, the other thing related, obviously, to the Oscars is that there's supposed to be some new regulations coming out from Georgia just released theirs, and California is gonna release theirs later today or tomorrow. And how that might affect film production going forward. Obviously, we know it's going to affect it. Everybody, and you know, I mean, obviously, I'm a filmmaker, so I'm, uh, 75% of my friends are, are filmmakers, which means that 75% of my friends are mostly out of work. Um, actors, uh, DPs, producers, editors, etc., because there's not a lot of stuff going on. So how are we going to be able to get back to work and obviously, there's going to have to be more spacing on set. There's going to have to be sort of, I don't know, man, if, if you have two different actors that are from two different households, you know, how are we supposed to, are we supposed to antibody test everybody? Are they going to, are we going to quarantine the actors for two weeks before we produce a scene so we know that they're both safe? Are people supposed to, you know, uh, write no more... No kissing scenes, no hand-holding scenes, no hug scenes. You know, uh, we can't change every story to fit a corona, COVID world, I don't think. So I think it comes down to, for any semblance of, of normal filmmaking, it, you're going to have to get a vaccine because how are you going to be able to trust two actors that don't know each other to be able to work together for something like that? The other thing that I saw was limits in between contact and specifically as it pertains to like hair and makeup. And obviously we love our HMUs and hair and makeup people because they're critical to the look of your film. But if you're not allowed to be within six feet of another person on set, how are you going to do their makeup? How are you going to do their hair? And some of the early signs are pointing to the fact that they may make actors predominantly do their own hair or just have very enhanced. You're going to be doing makeup in a hazmat suit, basically. So this is going to bring production costs up. I think that specifically independent filmmakers are not going to be as affected as big productions. Because I think even if you try to, because I think indie, you know, indie film sets at the bare minimum are like what we're doing now, which is one person running everything, like Kenny does. Thank you, Kenny. 
but s- most indie small sets are director, sound guy, a couple of AC, a couple of camera people, a couple of general production people, and the actors, maybe a producer or crafty, and a makeup artist. So, or a DIT person. So, but on a ultra low budget movie or a 30, $40 million budget movie or a TV show, you got at least 30 to 50 people at least on set plus talent above and below the line. So, I mean, you've been on all kinds of sets. How, how is that even possible? Um, I've been thinking about this a lot and, you know, even trying for like a TV show to try and get down to a skeleton crew is just, just seems to be an, impossible for me to figure out how to make that happen. But them having, you know, giant production studios and all these studios and streets and houses and locations already built, they don't really have to go out. I can see that helping them achieve you know making their 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 films and their you know shows and all that a lot more a lot better easier especially if you know just like barbershops and some other stuff is starting to be deemed you know essential hopefully maybe or not hopefully but whatever you know maybe that might happen somewhere <clears throat> where they they can start making movies with more people yeah, Korea and New Zealand, the places where it's, like, not doing as bad. I mean, for full-fledged production, I think we're at least two years away. <coughs> for some semblance, I mean, they started talking about the end of the month. I mean, they want to get people back to work, and I understand, but it's it's either, like I said, testing vaccines, et cetera, or, you know, I don't even know how you would film a two-person conversation scene. I mean, you're going to have to get very creative. There's going to be a lot of people that are having conversations over the phone, you know, because if, you know, if I need if I needed a, a scene of you and, you know, breaking up with somebody, you're going to have to break up over text or something if I'm going to get creative in a way to figure out how to shoot my movie, you know, or we just have to write the pandemic into everything. That's, I mean, that's the only other thing. I mean, whatever you have, have a pandemic draft done, you know, and adjust your movie to the time frame that we're in. I mean, that's the only other thing that would justify us seeing the separation and the, the precautions. And, I mean, hey, what if somebody fucking wins an Oscar while they're wearing a mask? I don't know, did Bat- somebody play Batman and win an Oscar? Who's the last person to win an Oscar wearing a mask predominantly? Leonardo didn't win for The Man in the Iron Mask. Jim Carrey didn't win for The Mask. What am I forgetting? Probably a lot. Uh, Maybe from The Crying Game? No. I don't know. Hmm. Interesting. So, I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see what sort of recommendation comes out from California and kind of look in depth into what George is doing. Uh, Vancouver as well in New York would be the main areas. Cuomo's trying to open up New York slowly. He just announced that he wants to open up uh, sp- like s- training camps for the New York sports teams. Um, I think it's probably because they were all going to stay in Florida and he kind of wants to get more tax dollars coming in. So it's kind of uh, everything, man. Sports, sports needs to come back. Sports is going to lead the way because I think Sports is going to require a lot of testing, a lot of quarantining, and a lot of, uh, and they'll probably be the ones that get the vaccines first because we need more entertainment. And I'm tired of watching games from like 2006. Yeah. They're already saying no audience, just live stream on TV and all that good stuff. You know, it's going to be inter- be interesting to see how all how players get paid and all that changes if yeah, that changes change. at all they might change they want it well major league baseball once first they had said okay we're going to pay you prorated so what we were going to pay you for 162 games if we only play 81 games you're going to get half your salary but for some reason they didn't take into account that they were going to probably because i think when the major league baseball owners thought oh we'll get an 82 81 game season but we'll be able to have fans in the stands so we will be able to make money on concessions, uh, 
gear, jerseys, pennants, etc., what have you. <clears throat> but now the reality is, like you said, that we're probably not going to have fans for whatever the rest of the NBA season this year is, and possibly for the entire baseball season this year, we may have zero fans in attendance, which means um, the people that are on unemployment right now that work for the service industry that sell you the beers, the hot dogs, the Cracker Jacks are unemployed. And the people that run the craft beer stands at Petco, they're unemployed right now because... And that means the owners of these teams are not going to get that revenue. So major league owners, for some reason, didn't think ahead and say, hey, we might not have uh, concessions. And now they're trying to go back on their deal and say, well, we did say we were just going to prorate your salary, but now we want to pay you differently. And major league baseball players union, which is probably the strongest union in sports, is like, eh, sorry. Sorry. We, we already basically agreed to this. We're not going back. So there's going to have to be a little give and take there in terms of the, the start. And then, but it's, it's true. Like some major league players have come out and said, I want my full salary. I'm out there and going to be the one taking the risk. Obviously, they're big, healthy athletes, so their percentage of chances of, of having serious issues goes down, but it's not zero. I mean, one of my heroes, Pat Ewing, um, tested positive this week. So, you know, that it, it's it, no, nobody's immune. Basketball players have been getting hit pretty hard. Kevin Durant, the dudes from uh, the Jazz, etc. So, in my opinion, the owners are always making so much more money than the players. Anyways, they've been making so much more more money than the players for years and years and years. Them just letting this deal go is not going to kill their pockets at all. Yeah, they're in gonna my opinion. Be- then they're dumb anyway. Some major league baseball owners. Cheap. All right, cool. Let me see. Okay. All right, so now it's time for uh, my week in media. As always, I remind you that I watch an incredible amount of TV shows and movies during the week. And don't shame me for it. All right, so everybody... And a lot of fanboys on the internet. And, you know, let's not even call them that. Let's just call them a lot of Snyder fans. um, Are excited because the Snyder Cut is going to see the light of day. After an impressive kind of hashtag release the Snyder Cut campaign HBO Max in 2021 is going to show his version of Justice League and I know one of the most adamant people I know a few people that are just full on Snyder fans they love Watchmen 300 For some reason, they like Sucker Punch, which, all right. But the question remains, what if it sucks? What if after all this campaign of wanting to see the director's cut, and I love director's cuts, what if after all that, We watch it, HBO, Max, whatever, 2021 when it comes out. We all sit there, and then at the end of it, you're like, either A, this sucks, or A, this isn't that much different than the Justice League that we got. So, as a comic fan and as a comic movie fan, do you think the Snyder Cut of Justice League will suck? Are you excited for it? If it sucks, then we would have two Justice movies that suck, which is very unfortunate because Justice League is my favorite league of superheroes out of all the universes. 
Um, even though Marvel characters are my favorite, but Justice League is my favorite group. But anyways, um, this is actually my first time hearing about this. Um, this so. Well, you you've heard about the 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 hashtag though that people that there's people like release the Snyder cut, release the Snyder cut. It's been like a thing for like the last two years. A legend of the Snyder Cup came out. Oh, there's a there's his cut of the movie, and 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 it's darker, it's grittier, it, the color's you know, different. I think I I did hear about some of that stuff a while back, um, but I didn't hear about it being released like at all. So until now, I've been just working and doing my own thing and not watching the news and staying in the loop of everything lately, but. uh I'm excited for it, man. I I have hope. That gives me hope because I need something. Because that first one was just uh It's like so much potential. I at my 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 hopes were were so up there. I was so much so ready for this, you know, and it was just horrible, bad. I liked under the dead. I wasn't a huge fan of the three hundred Watchmen is also i mean it, I, I i couldn't get into it i don't like sucker punch man of steel i was okay with um batman versus superman i kind of okay i was okay with even though jesse uh eisenberg as as lex luther was not uh, not the business and justice league i didn't like too much but i'm always a big fan of director's cuts because I'm a director and I I haven't gotten to that level of studio interference or notes in my career. Uh, Obviously I hope to get there soon. So, I mean, maybe it would be a good problem to have to have the studio say, we're going to release this movie that you directed, but this is what we want. And I wonder what I would do, obviously in those same I think when you're starting off as a, a director, obviously you're more susceptible um, to kind of accept changes and notes. There's that one really cool Kevin Bacon movie where he was making a movie, and at the end he decided to make a movie he wanted, not the one the studio or his backers wanted. So, yeah, I guess it's going to be interesting to see if the Snyder suck cups and how the people that, are, um, that, are, that, that have been longing for it so far uh, feel about it so i want to get um we really like to get the justin berkwist because he's like one of the people that i see talk about it all the time and he's a huge sucker punch fan um and a snyder fanboy. to see how you think i did see some of the things that they were saying was that the people that wanted the snyder cut were just like a bunch of nerds and and fanboys and like internet incels and they're like just like they were trying to associate like this campaign that just is just a bunch of fans of movies really and they were trying to sort of paint them as this like internet fucking like like i don't know just like like losers basically and i i didn't agree with that um so my week in media uh begins with an old school movie that i watched and a movie that i watched that i had not seen before was the original version of the wicker man now they remade it uh, later on with um, uh, Nicolas Cage in the role. But uh, have you seen The Wicker Man? Are you familiar? The Nicolas Cage one, yeah. Cage. What was, what was that like? Two thousand and two or something? <laughs> two thousand and four. So here's a spoiler alert warning: if you haven't seen The Wicker Man, <clears throat> skip ahead about two and a half minutes. But. Uh, Wicker Man is about a guy who goes to this kind of remote island to investigate some shit. He, you know, blah, blah, blah. Turns out, lo and behold, they tricked him and they're going to fucking sacrifice him by putting him in a big wicker statue and burning him to death. And, um, yeah, that's what the movie's about. So, I don't know. I mean, movies that end in such a dramatic scene are always interesting to me because... It's all based on you not knowing what's happening at the end and getting that initial reaction from people. But knowing what happens at the end, because I've already seen the other version and I understand the story, um, it still was very interesting to say, specifically regarding um, the filmmaking techniques that they used in the 70s, um, including editing effects, uh, practical lighting, 
uh, the, the the way they just kind of were would ration out the types of shots that they would got they would get you know it was really cool to 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 look at it and study it from from that perspective and um, it's a 1973 British folk horror film so kind of exploring that area in time and film is also always fun for me and you know I liked it did I like it more than the Nick Cage 2006 version hmm I don't know I think um I think I want to watch the other one <laughs> as a rewatch at some point well the Nick Cage version I watched the 1973 version it was cool. I mean, it's not like earth shattering in terms of lot. Ah, it's a brilliant movie. It's just like, oh, okay, that's cool. This was, you know, sometimes it's cool to watch the movie that the remakes are made of. And I'm sure that there's, what is it, uh, 2006? So, you know, we're due in another five years, probably for another Wicker Man remake. I was young, so I just remember just just feeling like like a weird feeling. And like, what, what, what was that? What did I just watch? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, another movie that uh, my rewatch this week, or a movie that I had seen but I hadn't seen in a long time, so I kind of wanted to revisit it and kind of see how I felt about it a few years later, is um, Above the Rim, um, which you know has one of the dopest soundtracks out there. Really, um, you know, if we're talking about soundtracks hip-hop soundtrack specifically. Um, and then also Tupac, who I still think is pound for pound the best rapper actor of all time. So you have Tupac at the top, and then you have Nas at the bottom because he's the worst actor-rapper of all time. Ludacris is... Close down there. Common. I've always made fun of his acting because he was horrible in the. Uh, he was horrible in that in that in that Batman movie, a Suicide Squad. He was horrible, and um, he's been really bad in other things. So I've I've, I've always given. I think. Ice Cube, Q Tip. Yeah, yeah, they're they're good actors, but I think Pac is is the best. I mean, longevity-wise, Ice Cube definitely um, has the advantage, but then he also did, like, uh, Are We There Yet? So I don't know if Tupac would be doing, like, romantic comedies. I mean, he did Above the Rim. Uh, what was the the poetry one? I mean, never say never. But I, always, I always think about what, uh, uh, one thing, what Aaliyah... And what Tupac would be doing, because they were both actors and you know musicians at, at the same time, and they were pretty darn good when they were alive. I would only imagine um, what they would be doing today. I keep saying this whole thing like uh, Aaliyah would have been Tyler Perry before Tyler Perry, like year, mm -hmm. like ten years ago, before Tyler Perry, but she passed away, so. Whoever, who knows? I think Tupac would have won an Oscar. I mean, Juice, Poetic Justice, Above the Rim. Um, he did another movie, Bullet. I think Adam Sandler was in that one. Gridlocked, uh, gang related. He was really good in. So I mean, he had really four or five really solid roles. You know, and Above the Rim was one of those. I mean, obviously not as good as I think in Juice or Poetic Justice, where he showed a lot of range. Yeah, I wonder if. Tupac had a reel. I mean, he went to he is he is an actor. He yeah, went to dramatic actor. arts. Yeah. So I mean, I, I mean, obviously that's a sidetrack to to the movie, but I do think that he is number one in the rapper slash actor category. He's number one for me. Method Man is up there though. Method Man and The Wire and in the stuff that he's done, he showed you know he's a, he's a good actor. I mean, I give shit to Common, but at least he's trying to, to build that career. And Nas from Belly is just one of the worst performances of all time. Ludacris in that John Henry movie was horrible, but Ludacris in Fast and Five is comical. So, I mean, what are you going to do? We can do a whole podcast on worst rapper actors of all time. Um, but 
that was my my rewatch. So you know, above the rim, I for some reason I thought the movie ended tragically. Like I knew what happened at the end, and I thought, oh, okay, this is what's gonna happen. But I forgot that it, it sort of ended on an uplifting sort of um, ending. So that's weird that you kind of remember movies differently. I mean, I remember kind of the basic plot. It's kind of like, you know, this kid, blah, 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 um, needs to learn how to pass the ball, blah, 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 and he needs to learn his life lesson. And this other guy, the thing about the guy clapping the, the backboard and falling off a building seemed like a stretch. Like, I felt like that premise and how he decided never to play basketball again could have been stronger because it just felt like a, like a dream. It felt hokey. But uh, other than that, the movie stood up. The fucking soundtrack is banging. You got uh, one of the Dame, uh, Dame uh, Wayans in there. Um, kind of like a little bit over the top. It's, it's like a cool urban movie. It's a basketball movie. Some of the basketball scenes get repetitive. Um, I think they were like on a seven-foot rim. But... But overall, I enjoyed it. I mean, it was a, you know, if you haven't seen it and you want to catch uh, Tupac in one of his earlier roles and um, really Bernie like Mac, that. Bernie oh, Mac is in oh, it. Um, Mac, yeah. uh, Wood Harris, who played Avon Barksdale in The in the Wire, is in it. Um, obviously, Tupac, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 it holds up. It holds up both. Yeah, I know, I know a lot of these guys. All right, so... Above the Rim was my rewatch. Um, in terms of TV series, and this is something that I kind of finished a little while ago, but I, I forgot to mention, this is the uh, 2 a.m. burrito show, in it? And we eat burritos here, in it? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I watched Top Boy, and I started saying that in a bunch of other, um, I guess, London slang. As I was watching it, um, it's a British series that had two seasons of four episodes. This thing that's confusing about uh, Netflix sometimes. So I saw I saw this thing and it said Top Boy, and I watched it. Ten episodes. Um, it seemed like a British version of The Wire, and it uh, it captivated me, and I watched it. Boom, binged it, loved it in it, and. Uh, then after that, Netflix is like, well, did you like Top Boy? Because you should watch Top Boy Summer House. And I clicked on it, and it was two four-episode seasons that actually were filmed like nine years ago because it was what the new series was. So there was a series called Top Boy, came out on British TV, had two seasons, four episodes each. It was called Top Boy. Then Netflix picked it up for a third season. Drake was involved somehow. And then they did 10 more episodes, which should have been Top Boy season three, right? However, they just call it Top Boy, and that's it. And then what's actually season one and season two are called Top Boy Summer House. So... Yeah, so season one is actually season three, and then Top Boy Summer House one and two are actually season one and season two of the same show because it is the exact, I mean, it's not the exact same storyline. It is a continuing storyline that takes place like six years after the event of the first two seasons. So, but I do recommend it. It takes a second if you don't watch a lot of British TV to sort of get the... Um, gist of some of the slang and how it relates to but I think that they'd have they have a lot of cool like British hip hop that I'm not really up on that so the so the show sounded cool especially the the new the new season which is actually just called Top Boy not Top Boy Summer House and uh I saw a lot of solid acting I saw a lot of cool storylines uh, stuff that wasn't like 100 percent predictable and you know I'm a fan of British uh films and and TV as well. What do you, I mean, I know you've watched it, but did you watch all three of the seasons or just the new one or just the old ones? Just the old ones. Okay, so you had seen them in the correct order. Yeah. Okay. I really liked it. It's really good. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> just, 
and like I'm, I'm really good. I, 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 I get their slang, and even for the ones that have a, the heavy, heavy accent. But I, I could definitely see for some people they, they would be like, what, huh, what? I would just say stick it out. Like you'll start to, you'll understand. Yeah, I mean, throw the captions on for a little bit, you know, and then you're good to go. But that sort of brought me to another topic that I wanted to talk to you about, which you had brought up, or I think, because you had heard me talk about it the last week, which is the right and wrong way to consume media after it's all out there. Obviously, the traditional way that we used to watch TV, Friends, The Office, and stuff like that is, you know, you, and even back in the day, you had to, if you wanted to watch uh, Seinfeld, you had to be in front of your TV on Thursday night at 9 o'clock or Friends, or any other shows that were like appointment TV. If you wanted to watch Adult Swim, you had to be up at midnight. If you wanted to watch, you know, the the old one that we always talk about is like the Sunday night sports show where they used to do all the highlights and stuff, Sports Machine. You had to stay up till Sunday night to watch that shit. Now we consume media at a fucking meteoric pace. We can We have everything on demand. I always talk about that old, old-ass commercial from back in the day where it was like, a pie in the sky dream, which is like, it was right when the internet was starting and they're like, what's on TV? And they're like, every movie and every TV show ever made. And it was like, wow, in the future, you're going to have access to all these things. And now we're fucking here. So we can watch everything. I can watch a movie by um, the the guy who did Lobster, uh, Yorgos Lathamos, and then say, fuck, I'm not up on all these dudes' movies. I'm going to watch his other four movies today or over the next couple of days. Um, So since we have all this access to this stuff, and I'm not talking about stuff that's coming up periodically because there's still some stuff that comes out week to week. But when you have access to this vast library of human creation and film and TV, and you just learn about somebody like Yargos, is there a specific way to watch media? That or specific media, like if you just learned about Zack Snyder, what Zack Snyder? I mean, Zack Snyder super fans. If somebody was like, "Oh, I heard about Zack Snyder cut. Uh, I haven't watched any of his movies. Which of his movies should I watch first? Right now, if you ask me about like the directors I know that I'm fucking fans of, like <clears throat> if somebody had never heard of Quentin Tarantino. What would you have them watch first? Would you have them watch Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs? Should you watch all his movies in order, or can you jump around? Right? Um, It also comes up, and the way we started talking about it was, you watched Ozark before you watched Breaking Bad. Yeah. It messed it up. Because, you know, people hyped up both. And Breaking Bad is is such an older show um, I don't know why I just just did it. I just watched Ozark first because that's I'm more quarantine. I'm in in my room and that's what people are talking about on Facebook a lot. And people are like, "Oh, I finally watched Ozark. It was good. I can't believe I've been passing it up." And I'm like, "I'm passing it up too. So let me not pass it up." I watched it, and then Lou. But you knew, but you knew that you knew the wire existed. I mean, you know, I'm not the wire. You knew Breaking Bad existed. I did, but I didn't know that they were so similar. And then you were, when I was, I mentioned to you, I was watching Ozark, and you were like, yeah, it's like Breaking Bad. And I was like, really? I was like, oh, okay, let me watch Breaking Bad too then. So yeah, I, it's like, it's like Missouri Breaking Bad. Yeah, it right. definitely is. And it, you know, to me, I still haven't even finished. I'm on like the last five episodes of Breaking Bad, and like I could have finished that like three weeks ago, but I kind of. Yeah, yeah. Kind of stopped because well, I'm just Breaking Bad is is completed in a sense, and um, well, it is it is done except for they they came out with El Camino, which is the standalone movie that takes place after Breaking Bad, which is cool because you'll get to watch that in order. Yeah, but do you think that watching Ozark first diminished Breaking Bad? Because I watched Breaking Bad first, and it didn't diminish Ozark. Yeah, definitely. I think it definitely diminished it for me. I think if I would have watched Breaking Bad first. And then Ozark, I would have had a better experience. Just curious that it doesn't work both ways because I think that after I got past the similarities of Ozark, which was, okay, this is kind of like Breaking Bad. After that, then it became its own thing to me because the family dynamic is sort of different. And even though they have a wife that's a co-conspirator, etc. But it's... 
I mean, they're very similar shows. That's why it's like, you know, it's Breaking Bad on the fucking, in Missouri. Yeah, money laundering. I mean, some of the same uh, character developments are happening. The, the wife, the same things are happening to the wife. Similar stuff. It's very similar stuff. Um, you know, the, the, the husbands too, you know, right. very similar the brother, stuff. The brother uh, was, uh, the brother-in-law was uh, a bipolar schizophrenic as opposed to a DEA agent. Right. That dude had one of the best roles on TV recently, though. He should, he should get nominated for it. Oh, that guy? The brother? Yeah. Yeah, Man, the brother. That, was, really good. that was rough. Him? Um, the uh, Kim Wexler, the, the, the actress who plays Kim Wexler on, on Better Call Saul. Um, and I forget their names. Uh, but the girl who plays the, the main chick on Barry plays one of the actresses. Those are... The, those are like the, the, the TV performances that stand out the most to me. Um, but yeah, the question remains like, is there a right or I don't think there's a right or wrong way to watch movies, but it does possibly change how you feel about them based on the order that you do it. So The Ozarks is a great show. It stands alone. Breaking Bad is one of the all-time good shows, and you watch them in, in the reverse order, and it sort of was like made you feel eh, about Breaking Bad. But I watched Breaking Bad several years ago. I've rewatched it, and when I watched the Ozark after the initial thing, I was I was in on Ozark after the fact because I was like, okay, I get it. It's kind of like Breaking Bad, but it's doing his own thing, and I really like Breaking Bad, and I can't get enough of that sort of story. So fuck it, I'm all in on it. You know? I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. I really like Breaking Bad too, but I think I would have liked it ten times more if you would have watched it first. Yeah. Okay. So I um. I advise everybody to definitely, if you have not seen Breaking Bad, if you have not seen Ozark, but plan to, my advice would be to watch Breaking Bad first and then to watch Ozark. Just in case. And watch Top Boy Summer House before you watch Top Boy. So if you want to watch Top Boy, search a little deep deeper, watch Top Boy Summer House. It's only four episodes, two seasons, and then watch what's actually called Top Boy Season 1. As a second one, and I think that I mean I still enjoyed it the other ones, but I was like, oh okay, I already know where these characters ended up at the end of the season. I watched now it's kind of like watching, I guess. But in in essence, because uh, have you, you haven't watched Better Call Saul, right? Okay, yeah, because Better Call Saul is weird because a lot of the characters that you already know where they end up at the end of Breaking Bad are just starting their journey in Better Call Saul. And I don't think knowing where they end up diminishes from the, the storylines that you do. You do ultimately know that X, Y, and Z, this happens to this person, this happens to that person. And you're seeing them, and it's like, oh, I want to see this person. So in the back of your mind, at the beginning, you're like, damn, he dies or she dies or whatever. But it's still cool to see them kind of in action. So I think prequels, sequels, you know, if they're, 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 they're going to be associated with these major shows no matter what. Yeah, I I think um, I'm okay with uh, Better Call Saul. Safe, I would say, better. Um, I'm excited for it, so I don't think it's going to be diminished or anything because I watched it in whatever, out of order. I'm excited for it when I get to it. All right, and then the worst movie that I saw this week, and I'm going to keep it short on this one, is if you like 1918, you'll hate 1922. Uh, obviously... Uh, 1922 is a movie that's on Netflix. You'll be tempted to click on it. Don't. It sucks. All right. So the last thing in my week in media is movies that I had missed or that um, has sort of, for some reason or another, I never got around to watching. And I watched Snowpiercer with Captain America, Chris Evans, amongst others. And this is a movie... This is one of them Bong films, not Cheech and Chong, but Bong Joon Hu, who recently won an Oscar for Parasite. So another case of, you know, what's the right way to watch all his movies? I remember the first movie that I watched by him was a, a Korean movie called The Host, where for that time it was some pretty cool special effects, and it's it basically um, a film about a monster in Korea. It's a monster movie, and it's a well-made one, and... I guess it's about family structure the same way Parasite is about global warming, which is his movies on purpose have a lot of depth to them 
uh, past like their aesthetic and past the storyline and, and, and the interesting concepts. But as a filmmaker, it, it's always been weird to me to to purposely put themes in my movie. It's more like I write and then I rewrite and then I recognize the themes and then I kind of then sort of either steer away or steer into them based on whether I'm like, oh, I guess I'm sort of talking about this. Um, do I really want to talk about that? Is that really like the subtext here? Is that really sort of what this is uh, taking the place for? So it's really interesting that he seems to build all these um, sort of commentary about um, class structure and about issues that are important to him into his films. And these sort of, I guess, I don't know if you call them allegories or stories, are mirroring uh, real-life events or making you at least think about real-life events. So he's obviously, I mean, the Parasite was so good that they couldn't even just demote it to best foreign language film. It had to win best film. And, you know, people had a little backlash about watching a movie with subtitles win an Oscar or, you know, I don't know, maybe it's racism against uh, Asian filmmakers or something, but I think that it was an incredible movie and it deserved what it got. And, you know, I sort of, watching Snowpiercer, not even really realizing. I was like, oh, this was a movie of his. Um, and again, the the films that I had seen leading up to it had been a long time ago, uh, Host, which I've seen several times, and uh, Parasite, which I watched a couple of times. I hadn't seen Okja because it seemed weird to me and I didn't sort of want to go down that rabbit hole right away. But I am, I did watch Snowpiercer. And... You know, it, it was sort of uh, my first question. Have you seen, did you see Snowpiercer? No. Um, it's basically about post-apocalyptic world that's frozen and the only survivors are in this train that just keeps going around in circles. And it's got like this magical engine that just keeps going and going. And everything that they eat and live off of is on the train. But the people in the back are like the people that are in prison and the people that are in the front are like just living like lavish lifestyle like just living it up like, you know, debauchery, fucking just like if they were in their own little private penthouse. So again, it's a com it's a it's a commentary about class structure, like I said. But the actual movie itself had some cool action sequences. It was my big thing was like, where did the people sleep? Because all you saw was like the main quarters and like a school and stuff. But I, I really couldn't tell like where everybody like slept. Maybe I missed part of it, but it was an interesting rewatch. Uh, obviously, I think that the two other movies I had seen from him, Parasite and uh, Host, the Host, are both I think infinitely better. You had um, a lot of good actors hamming it up in the movie. I think that since it was his first sort of English language film, that might have contributed a little bit to it, um, but. It's kind of like eh, I kind of liked it, but then some part of it were like kind of like boring, and um, I would much rather uh, I watched uh, Train to Busan afterwards, which is a zombie movie that takes place on a train, because uh, I wanted to watch a better train movie. But uh, at least I got through it, so I think I'll I will try to watch Okja at some point or however you pronounce that because that was another uh his last movie before parasite did you watch parasite i haven't gotten to it yet i've been mm. saving it it's good it's yeah good. and the host if you haven't watched it already that's a good movie 2006 i'm gonna get to it yeah i'm gonna get to it hey we got nothing but time man right um that um apocalyptic uh train movie you said at first uh Sounded like I haven't seen it, but it sounds like it has the same feel to two movies I like. Um, in time with uh Justin Timberlake and uh, what was that? Uh, Elysium was that Matt Damon or was it the other dude that looks like Matt? No, Damon? Matt Damon, Elysium was Matt Damon, yeah, and that sort of takes place in like uh, that's the guy that did District 9, mm -hmm. so that, that takes place in that sort of like world, Elysium. I like Elysium. Uh, and in time where they, they gamble with the, the thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
because they had the same little thing like districts and the higher the districts, the the more richer the neighborhood was, and it was yeah, crazy. no, it, it's definitely. Um, and then I I did and I had um, there's another movie that I saw this week called The Platform, which is on Netflix, and it's about a a prison structure where it's like 200 floors and um, it's a pit. And um, so basically it's a cell with like an elevator in the middle. But this platform um, starts at the top and goes all the way to the first floor. And at the top, they just fill this entire table with nothing but like lobster and cake and wine and everything, right? And the way it works is you eat and then as soon as you're done eating, the, the platform goes further below. So there's enough food on the platform for everybody. But if the people up top and like the top 50 floors like gorge and just like, oh, like fucking just like smash their face with food. Dang. By the time it gets down to like 150th level, all there is is like shells and like broken glass and empty bottles. And they're like fighting for it and, and shit. Like, no, but it's only two people per floor. Uh, so the top two people at the first floor get to pick their choose, and then it keeps going down and down and down. So it's really weird. It's a, I think it's a European movie because it, it, it didn't have subtitles. It was dubbed. So I watched the dubbed in English version, which worked for me this time. Usually I just like watch it in the original language with subtitles, but I couldn't pay too much attention to it. So I, I, I was doing something. I was editing while I was watching it, but I did enjoy it. Um, in time, not so much. Justin Timberlake did good in that one, actually, though. Um, but I did like Elysium a lot, but the platform is another one that I saw that, that sort of dealt with that sort of, not a class, a class structure within that sort of very, it was more like an experiment than a prison because people could, could volunteer to go into it. But basically if you were in the floor 150 or something like that, you were basically, you had to eat your cellmate because wow. by the time it got down there, there was no food left. So people would try to like tell the people above them, hey, let's all ration the food out. But the people above you were like literally above you. And so they could literally like shit on you, piss on you and just be like, fuck you. You know, I'm just going to shit. I'm literally just going to shit on this because I don't want it. And you can eat my shit, you know. So and, and every month you would get moved up and down. So one, one month you'd be like number three and you'd have your choice. And then the next week you'd be like, ah, I guess I have to kill my fucking cellmate because I can't, I, I can't eat. I got to eat. That's, that's nuts right there. That's crazy. I liked it, but I liked it, but I thought they were going to go deeper into it. Like, um, by the time it was ending, I wanted it to keep going on. So I guess I, I liked the movie because I wanted to sort of explore that environment more. So I'm wondering if there's other films that are sent around that. And then the other one that I mentioned was Train to Busan, which is a very fast paced uh, zombie thriller. Um, again, I'm not the huge fan of the zombie genre when it's on an indie level, because I believe it's kind of very easy to do it really bad. But when it's like a filmmaker and they have a, an interesting take or a concept on the zombie film, um, or location in this case, the train to Busan, which is basically a, what would happen if you were like on a super train while a zombie outbreak was just starting to happen. Um, and it's uh, very well done. One of my favorite movies of the last five years or so in terms of that impacted me and that I really liked. So that's another one I threw in there. Like I said, this is the amount of movies and TV shows that I have watched over the last two weeks. I do not apologize for it. I have movies playing in the background literally probably 80% of the time that I am awake. So don't judge me. Uh, so... Thank you for helping produce the show, as always, Kenny, and for being the behind-the-scenes uh, commentator, co-host, guy behind the camera. You're welcome, Luke. And that's going to do it for episode two of the 2 a.m. burrito show. Uh, make sure you like, sub, follow the feed, whatever you have to do, and tell your friends about this smooth-talking criminal the podcast.
We'll try better next time. Thanks for listening.